It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lynn Marie Morsky. Uh, Lynn Marie got her MD at St. Louis University School of Medicine, completed her residency at the Mayo Clinic. She's the co-founder and president of the Psychedelic Medicine Association, host of the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast, and medical director at New Life Health. Please welcome Dr. Lynn Marie Morsky. All right. So before we get started, you know, we talk a lot about uh, the global mental health crisis and the one billion people that are estimated to suffer from uh, some form of mental health. I just wanted to put up some numbers as a baseline to start this conversation uh, uh, with Lynn Marie. Um, th this is a 30-year picture. This is data from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation from 1990 up through 2019. Uh, and those are the four uh, largest categories of mental health disorders. PTSD is in the anxiety disorders, and you can see the rise over time. And yes, some of these are related to a more open stance uh, in reporting, a more comfort people talking about this and, and reporting on it, but wanted to share some of the baseline data as we start this conversation about psychedelic medicine with Dr. Morsky. Uh, so Limery, from where you sit at the, at the uh, Psychedelic Medicine Association, how do you just at a first level define what psychedelic medicine is? So the definition of psychedelic period is, is always kind of a moving target. Many people have the, the thought of what is a classical psychedelic versus something that's a hallucinogen. But psychedelic medicine as an umbrella term, we tend to refer to things that are therapeutics that use psychedelics as part of that therapeutic. So it may be the entire therapeutic, but very often it's a therapeutic component along with something like psychotherapy. And a unique characteristic of psychedelic medicines compared to you know, antidepressants or a lot of the traditional medicines is that they're not aimed at treating the symptoms, chasing symptoms day after day. They're very often aimed at getting to the root of whatever the mental illness may be or other illness because we're seeing a lot of physical ailments being investigated at this point. But we're aiming to investigate the root, treat the root so that you don't have to chase the symptoms day after day. Got it. And that, as a, like an SSRI, for example, is, is seeking to treat the symptoms and not the root cause. Okay. Um, and so when you say the therapeutic side, so the therapy component is not a necessary component, but it's often paired with that. I mean, in, in your viewpoint, is, is therapy the, a key component in, in, in psychedelic medicine treatments? So what I love about these questions is that it doesn't matter what my opinion is. It's what the science says, right? And so at this point, there, you know, everything is still ongoing. So most of the trials that we've seen so far have a therapeutic component. However, there are a number of trials that are coming out that may not have a therapeutic component because uh, Johns Hopkins uh, just did a study that Professor Matt Johnson reported on, and it was a survey of people doing psychedelics, and the results with therapy and without therapy were comparable. And so, you know, as we go on, and as therapy is definitely a bottleneck in this, because there's only so many therapists we can train compared to the people, the amount of people who need this, there will be investigations. How much is the therapeutic component contributing to these outcomes? And so it, it's still, it's yet to be answered, but at this point, most of the things that are looking toward FDA approval have a therapeutic component. Okay. Um, all right, so let's talk about some specific compounds. Um, in the medical community, what are the ones that are generating the most interest? What are the ones that are the most focused that you're, that you're focused on now? So the three that we are most focused on uh, are ketamine, which is currently legal, the one, and, and again, Per the definition, it is more of a dissociative and not a classical psychedelic, but it still gives it a hallucinogenic um, experience, so we, we kind of lump it in. But it's the legal one, so that's very much in our, in our purview. And then we also talk a lot about MDMA, which is likely to be the first FDA-approved psychedelic, and behind it, psilocybin. Okay, let's dive into this a little more detail, if we could uh, pull the slide up. So let's start with the one you mentioned first, the legal one, ketamine. What can you tell us about how it's used and, and uh, what, how the medical community is embracing it now? So ketamine it was initially created as an anesthetic, uh, but it was found over the years to have antidepressant properties. And so that led to more use as an off-label treatment for depression. And so studies have found that it's extremely efficacious in treating depression and acute suicidality. And that's one of the most important things. If anybody you know, takes one bullet point out of ketamine, is that if you know somebody who's acutely suicidal and they're not, say, currently on an SSRI, an SSRI can take up to six weeks to take effect whereas ketamine can take effect in that first 45 minutes where you're doing it. And so for a person who might be having suicidal thoughts, they may have no joy left in their life and found no reason left to live, that experience they have in that 45 minutes may show them a glimpse of a different world enough to help them hang on until something like an SSRI can continue. And one of the benefits of ketamine is you don't have to get off your SSRI or your, your other antidepressant to do ketamine. 
which is different from a lot of the other psychedelics. So it's really versatile. So currently it's in off-label use. For, um, IM and IV, as you see on there, that's intravenous and intramuscular. And um, it's also used as a nasal spray. It's also used in at-home clinics in lozenge form or tablet form. And so there are a lot of different mechanisms by which a person can take this, and that makes it very versatile. For the people who are you know, the most acutely, perhaps, suicidal, or they're using it for alcohol treatment or something that's of a higher acuity, more likely an in-person intravenous or intramuscular experience. For those who are uh, you know, less acuity, they may do an at-home or a nasal spray. And um, like I said, it, it's very effective. The typical course is, um, that's been studied is generally six sessions over two or three weeks. And then that really helps, especially treatment-resistant depression. And you may need a booster a month later, six months later. So it, it's not that it's a one and done, but it is definitely more of a one and done than a daily uh, antidepressant or SSRI. Okay, gotcha. The, um, and so what's the, what's the experience like? What do you hear from patients? What is it like to go through that treatment, those six, six sessions? It's very dependent on the dose. Um, you know, lozenge at home is different from the intravenous. Uh, they can have a full ego disillusion, which uh, if anybody isn't familiar with that term, if you've had a psychedelic and you are familiar, you'll know. Um, but it's where you no longer identify with like, I'm no longer Lynn Marie. I'm just like, who is that person that was Lynn Marie? And you can really separate from a lot of your identities and a lot of your traumas and a lot of the labels you put on yourself or the stories you've told yourself, which is why it can be very helpful. So that's something that can happen at some, some of the higher doses. Um, but there is kind of a dissociation from your body, which um, is very effective often for pain treatment as well. Um, but to, you know, in the lower doses, you may just feel kind of tingling and feel like a lightness and a little bit floaty. Um, but it does help you in whatever that state change, or that, yes, that state change is that you have, very often helps you reevaluate things that may have been kind of like a rut before, like a, a, a thought rut, you know, the default mode network we talk a lot about, but it's just that voice in your head that keeps telling you the same negative story all the time. This very often lets you kind of separate and reevaluate. Okay. And, and uh, on a side question, do are insurers covering this? How, what does the insurance picture look like for ketamine? So as you see on the slide here, FDA, uh, so most of the ketamine use is off-label. Like I said, it was FDA approved as an anesthetic you know, years ago, and now uh, Johnson & Johnson's Janssen came out with Spravato, which is the left-handed version of ketamine, of the getting very chemical. Um, and so that's specifically FDA approved for treatment-resistant depression. And since it's not an off-label use, it can be covered by insurance. So that one is. And then there are many other places that are working very creatively to get ketamine covered, the, the generic. And there's also something called the, the ketamine task force, if you're interested, that is trying very hard to go through. Because getting something covered by insurance that's a generic that nobody has like a financial stake in is hard. And so there's a lot of steps to get that covered. So the ketamine task force is working on it. Okay, great. Uh, let's move on to the next one that's in the pipeline, okay. um, MDMA. So can you tell us about where this stands and where the medical community is looking to this, some of the trials that are happening right now with MAPS? Yes, absolutely. And I know we have Liana from MAPS as a speaker later in the day, so she could give you even more um, up-to-date information. But they are in, in, in phase three trials, wrapping up phase three trials. and, and the results for MDMA, assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, again, this is one of those where therapy is not an optional component. It has been investigated, so it's MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD. But if you know anything about PTSD, it has been extremely difficult to treat. People are on two and three antidepressants, they're taking therapy, and that's very often just barely managing the symptoms. And here with, with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, they get two or three sessions with MDMA. They have psychotherapy before, during, and after. And, and look at the results. So here we have two-thirds of the people in the MDMA group no longer meet the diagnostic criteria for PTSD. Because PTSD is diagnosed with this scale that the doctor administers. And two-thirds of the people taking this MDMA-assisted psychotherapy route no longer qualify. They, you know, when, they, when they're asked about their symptoms, they no longer qualify for PTSD. That's incredible. That's something that they're not taking two antidepressants and doing therapy and still barely managing. They've probably found a way through the MDMA to revisit the trauma. So MDMA, it, it has the ability to take the amygdala offline. The amygdala is the fear center of the brain. And so if you're able to take that a little bit offline, you working with your therapist can very generally or, or very commonly revisit whatever the trauma was and reframe it. Because it's, you know, when it happened, it's stuck in your brain in a certain way that's causing all these symptoms. If you can revisit it without the fear and maybe recategorize it, then that very often leads to this improved outcome. Okay, that's great. 
Um, I, I, we want to get through a few more. And, and again, we're going to have a, a, a round of audience questions. We'll put the QR code up if you didn't have a chance to scan it. Uh, we're going to, Lynn Marie's going to definitely take some questions at the end of this. Let's move on to psilocybin. I know we have a, a little bit to cover here. Um, w uh, this has been being researched in a lot of different ways. Can you take us through some of the, the most interesting research from a medical perspective? Absolutely. So if any of you saw, it was on 60 Minutes, I think in 2019, which was one of the first things on the major mainstream media uh, for psychedelics to appear. But psilocybin has been investigated, like Brad said, a number of things, but one of the kind of most touching and initial large trials was that Johns Hopkins studied it in end-of-life anxiety. And so these are people with like terminal cancer, very afraid of death very often and, and anxious about that portion of their journey. And with psilocybin assisted therapy, you know, they have a therapist there, um, psilocybin produced these massive decreases in the anxious feelings that they had. And over 80% of them experienced much, uh, a significant increase in their well being and life satisfaction. Very often, if you've done a psychedelic, this will probably ring true to you. In these deeper journeys with the higher doses, very often we have kind of a death-like experience or we see, we feel like we're seeing something on the other side, which makes you realize, oh, that's not so scary. And I think that has been a, a huge piece in why these end of life um, treatments are so effective because once, once they've had a taste of what they may be fearing, it no longer seems so scary to them. And so this has been a, a significant study for that field. Great. This is another big one. So uh, psilocybin is most likely going to be FDA approved after MDMA for treatment of depression. And so, you know, in this specific study that we have here, they're looking at major depressive disorder. 71% of participants uh, had a clinically significant response to the intervention. The, the amounts for, you know, and the, the intervention is, let's see, like one or two administrations of psilocybin, again, as opposed to a daily SSRI. With daily antidepressants, only 60% of people respond. And when they respond, they might have a decrease in depression, but very often, often they have a lot of side effects. There may be a numbing of emotions and a number of you know, sexual side effects, et cetera. With psilocybin, we don't have those side effects. You take it once or twice with the therapy, and 71%, which is higher than the SSRI you know, for people taking them, um, had a clinically significant response. And then here we have over half at week four were in remission, which same thing with that, you know, like they no longer satisfy those criteria for depression. So that's a, that's a really significant finding. It's incredible. So we, we've covered the end of life sort of uh, cancer treatments and, and positive life feelings. We've covered uh, major de depressive disorder. There's been some recent developments and uh, in studies related to addiction. Can you talk us through two of those? Yes, so the, the smoking cessation is a slightly older study, but the NIH has just granted the first psychedelic focused grant in something like 50 years to Professor Matt Johnson to, to follow up on this study. Because if you any of you are medical professionals and have tried to treat smoking cessation, or if any of you have tried to stop smoking, you know this is very difficult. And there's the, the patch and all the, you know, Wellbutrin, all these things they try. Well, they tried psilocybin with cognitive behavioral therapy. And 60% of those participants were no longer smoking at 16 months with two or three sessions of psilocybin. We're not talking a daily patch. We're not talking all the other things. This is what they did. Over half were still abstinent at 16 months. So that's very impressive. And they're going to do some follow-up on that. But the one that's come out recently is psychedelics, or, or psilocybin for, and again, it's psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy for the treatment of alcohol use disorder. And we know how alcohol use disorder is extremely prevalent, has so many downstream health effects. If we could address this with psilocybin, this would be amazing. That showed that with two, dis two doses of psilocybin and psychotherapy, that it can reduce, it like reduce the heavy drinking by 83%. This is incredible. Think about you know, how many AA and all the things that have been tried to, to reduce drinking. Psilocybin, two or three, or two doses with psychotherapy had that same effect. It's incredible. Um, we're gonna go to the QR code just so that we have time. Uh, we ha we're, we're gonna keep asking some questions, but I wanted to put this back up so that you guys can scan this and, and please send them in uh, and I'll check these in a minute. Let's cover some of the other uh, less studied but promising uh, compounds. Um, and just to, just to name a few, with LSD, there's, there's current trials for generalized anxiety disorder, cluster headaches, adult ADHD. You and I were talking about DMT. It's being treated for uh, major depressive disorder, but also. So yeah, this is one of my, my, yeah. one, of my, one of my favorite studies that I believe is, is still ongoing is DMT for stroke. So DMT has, uh, at least in vitro, found to lead to neurogenesis, which is the regrowth of neurons. And so if you know how a stroke works, very often parts of the brain, the neurons in the brain, are, are cut off and then die. And so to address stroke through something that could recreate 
some growth in some neurons would be amazing. And so this, this leads to a question that I know you and I were going to discuss, so I'm just going to go there. Go for it. But you know, a, a discussion that happens in our industry very often is, <laughs> is whether or not the trip portion, the journey, the, the hallucinogens are necessary for something to be therapeutic. And I, I think the answer is, yes, I'm a lawyer, but we'll answer this anyway. Like, the answer is it depends, which we say for everything. But very often, you know, if we're looking at something physical like DMT for stroke, if it's going to be acting on a physiologic level, regrowing the neurons, is a trip necessary for that? Uh, maybe not. And so, we're, you know, it's, it's important, you know, as, as business people who may be, you know, leaders in this field to keep an open mind that it's not an either or. It's just like a yes and because there are some people that the journey will be necessary for and some people who the journey might frighten off and they might never get the therapeutic benefit and they also might not need it for certain conditions. Right. All right. And while questions are coming in and I see a couple coming in, uh, let me just ask you a little bit about how the medical community itself is, is, uh, looks at these, uh, the development of these compounds. And like, what would you say the biggest challenges are facing the medical community with regard to these coming, becoming legal and, and approved? Education is the biggest hurdle. because So I graduated from medical school in 2005. Uh, cannabis wasn't even mentioned to us. Definitely not psychedelics. And so think about the fact that when these things are legal, let's say MDMA is approved next year, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, how many primary care doctors are gonna feel comfortable referring their patient to MDMA-assisted psychotherapy when the last thing they heard about MDMA was just say no, don't do drugs, you'll fry your brain. Like, so we have such a hurdle to get over. So that's why I founded the Psychedelic Medicine Association, specifically to educate the clinicians that are on the front lines, not the people who are going to be doing the therapy. These are the people who are going to refer to the therapy. And if they don't refer to the therapy, they're gonna keep handing out the same antidepressants or whatever that may not be the most effective for that patient. And so I'd say education is the biggest hurdle. Okay. So we have uh, about eight minutes. That's gonna give us plenty of time to get to some of these questions. Um, so the first one, I don't know if you're gonna how you're gonna feel this one. Dr. Morsky, will we ever see FDA embrace a whole plant or a whole mushroom as a legit approved medicine? Yeah, any opinion on that? So again, I, my opinion does not matter. What matters <laughs> is whether or not this is, is something that they can, right? Like, so I don't, you know, I have to be very honest, I don't know the FDA, uh, you know, approval process as to whether that is, you know, something that can be patented or approved. So forgive me that I'm not the okay. person to answer that. Are you aware of any studies related to the potential health benefits of Amanita muscaria? I, I am so. not. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> that, that doesn't mean they don't exist. Again, like if you go to clinicaltrials.gov and you type in Amanita muscaria, maybe there are trials involving that. And you've, you have fielded some of these uh, questions, and, and some of these are trial related, so I'm gonna keep trying if you don't know them. <laughs> um, how about the effects of combining psilocybin and MDMA? That, I don't know of any active studies, but I do know that people have talked about that. And so you have to realize this is such a nascent industry so things that are being investigated right now, we're like at the baseline, but imagine the, the potential, right, of combining things later, trying different types of therapies. We, we saw psilocybin with cognitive behavioral therapy for smoking cessation. What if we try psilocybin with EMDR or psilocybin with hypnotherapy? Like there's so many different formations and combinations that, that I hope we do investigate. And is the education process for the medical community, I mean, are, are, are the, the doctors you speak with, are they trying to stay up to date on all these studies? I mean, how is it possible to, to follow all of this? I mean. That's got to be one of the major challenges of just, just learning about what's out there. Right. That's why we made the association. So every month we send them like the six latest applicable, clinically applicable research studies in, in psychedelic studies. But absolutely, it's difficult to keep, think about your primary care doctor. If you go to a, an internist or a, or a PCP that has to know everything from urology to neurology, they have basics of, you know, doing your GYN exam. Like there's so many things they need to know. And so that's really difficult for a primary care doctor. So that's why we're trying to give them the most applicable information. Psychiatrists, it's a little easier because they get to focus in on mental health, but they have so many different conditions and medicines they need to, to juggle. So with our association, we try to let you know, like, this is what's clinically available now. Here, we have ketamine right now. Let's tell you everything about the different forms so that you can feel comfortable making a referral. And then we've started telling them about MDMA and psilocybin so when they're available, they feel like they have enough basis to have that conversation. I see. Okay. Um, well, as far as training, what training is required or recommended for uh, even right now with ketamine and MDMA possibly in the next year or two, what training is required of doctors to be able to start prescribing this? So, well, that is a, you had me until the doctors start because, right, oh, okay. because, because uh, for most of this, it's, you know, the doctor might be doing the prescription, 
But this is the psychedelic assisted psychotherapist world. And that's where most of the training is taking place now. So MAPS has a training for MDMA assisted psychotherapy, CIIS, California Institute of Integral Studies, I believe it's called, um, Naropa. There are many training programs that you can go through as a psychotherapist. For ketamine, there's ketamine assisted psychotherapy, the PRATI, the ketamine training center. There's a number of places um, if you want to be doing these assisted psychotherapy routes. The, the, very often the doctor is not necessarily the one doing the therapy. They can be, sometimes, um, but then they should be getting that psychotherapeutic training. The actual, like, how to write a prescription is, right. is much less. So, you know, I, I know with MAPS that to write the MDMA prescription, they will make you go through, through something called a REMS, which is a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy thing that if you're writing, like, Suboxone now, you have to go through that, that same process to be able to write it. Okay. But it's just, a, like, a few hours course kind of thing. I see. You, you addressed this a little bit at the beginning, but uh, maybe a clarifying point. Why are ketamine and MDMA referred to as psychedelics when they are clearly classified differently? Why do you think, that, why do you think they fell into this category? Because of the experience. So, like, it's really difficult if I'm, like, running the Psychedelic Medicine Association, which I am, to call it, like, the psychedelic and MDMA and, and disassociative and, and empathogen and empathogen, whatever. It's just we had to have a, an umbrella term. And, you know, most people in the industry, you know, Rick, will, Rick Doblin, who's the, you know, guru behind MDMA being, becoming a medicine, will say that. Like, this is not a classic psychedelic, but how do we talk about these? You know, I, we could say hallucinogens, but... You know, is MDMA really hallucinogen or is it more like an empathogen? Like there's, there's so many different ways we can categorize this. And so unfortunately we've had to just find this, this way to, to, to cover the umbrella to speak about them. Okay. Um, this is sort of related to how trials are conducted in the science. Have we had enough time to look at the potential long-term side effects of these compounds? We have not had a, uh, and what is enough time, I guess, is the question. You know, I don't know how, how long your average FDA trial for an antidepressant or for an antipsychotic or for a cholesterol medicine, I don't know how long they follow people out. But absolutely, like, that is something we, we should be on the lookout for. What we do know is that, you know, we have, you know, studies like the surveys that Matt Johnson and his team at, at Hopkins do. And, and please participate in those because people are putting out studies a lot. You know, if you have side effects years later, please report on these studies. We know that there are certain um, dangers like HPPD that can, may be associated with psychedelics, we're unsure. Um, so like if, if, you know, if, you, if you see an opportunity to contribute to data, please do. Okay, there's a lot of questions coming in. You're, you're, this is a popular uh, Brad was afraid session. we'd have none, and I said I don't <laughs> right. think that's gonna happen. All right, we have time for a few more. <laughs> uh, um, okay, so um, I did a lot of combination uh, uh, studies. There was one in here. Um, about, I guess this is putting on, uh, on your hat, props of possibly giving advice to a, an aspiring therapist. What would be a great set of questions on a questionnaire for someone seeking uh, ketamine or, or MDMA-assisted therapy uh, post, uh, like part of the integration after the effect? What kind of things would a therapist be, you know, um, you know good to ask as, and, and as, as part of the therapeutic regimen? So that's a very interesting question because integration coaching, integration therapy is an entirely separate field. And so if you're a therapist seeing somebody after they've done ketamine, it, it is, you're, you're a little bit, unfortunately, like out of the, the realm of, of the people who are trained specifically in that. So one thing is you can ref recommend that your person see a specific integration coach. Um, because th that integration coach might have separate modalities. I have to say that like very often a lot of us, we, you know, we do journey after journey and if we don't properly integrate, we keep getting the same messages time and again. And so it takes a skilled integration therapist to help you really work that, you know, say I was taught why not to be anxious in my therapy, but it never really works its way into my nervous system. My nervous system is, is still gonna respond anxiously. And so that integration is, is really important. So if you're a therapist out there, I would recommend either getting integrated, integration therapy trained. A lot of the things are not in-depth courses. They're like, I'm saying they're not like year-long courses. You can get kind of the basics. Um, but otherwise, uh, that, that's a hard question. You know, like, are you, st maybe ask, are they still flashing back to the thing? Or like, are they, are they have questions about what they saw? But it, this is really, I'm, I'm, I'm unequipped to, to answer this question. You're doing a great job a fielding. This is a lot of, this is a lot of, uh, of questions. Let me, let's end on this one. Oh, hold on, uh, I didn't even finish that one. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Just, I'll finish that yeah, one. Please. Look, I'm just punting to my own podcast. So <laughs> if you look like, go to the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast and like go like, four or five episodes back, we had somebody on there who actually did a study on how to, to see where somebody is in integration. And so they like made a scale of like, how's your integration going? So take a look at that episode. It's with, uh, it's very appropriately like titled something about, you know, monitoring your integration therapy or something. But I would also go to, you know, maybe psychedelic.support or Fluence or one of the places or psychedelics today um, and, and, and take one of their courses on, on integration. 
Last question, are you aware of any studies or any science behind microdosing? <laughs> um, there are a number of studies, and the results are mixed. Some are showing that it's no better than placebo, and then some are showing some, some smaller effects. Uh, we need a lot more studies. Are, you know, and, we, and still the question is, is it from the microdose, or is it from the fact that a lot of people, when they start microdosing, change a lot of things about their life. They become more in intentional. Did they take the microdose every morning after making an intention, whereas they would usually just get up, drink coffee, and go about their day? They're, you know, it's generally a part of a larger picture. And so we have yet to kind of tease out all of those things. And so, again, check the podcast. There are a number of episodes on, you know, we've got James Fadiman, who is the godfather of microdosing, saying it does all the things. And we have Balash Segedi, who says, who ran the, placebo, the, the study that says it's no more than placebo. So much more research to come. Great. Thank you very much. Please uh, give a warm uh, round of applause for Dr. Lynn Marie Thank you. It was Absolutely. awesome. <laughs>